Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk. My name is Jorge Castillo, and I'm here today to talk about uh, functional, how to go functional programming over Kotlin. Okay? I'm a Spanish developer. I'm actually working for an international product company from Copenhagen, Denmark. It's called GoMore. And uh, what I do is just Android development, uh, Android development there in uh, quite a small team. I work remotely as a full-time remote engineer from, from, from home, from Spain, OK? Well, uh, first of all, let's talk about some key points, or at least some points that I think should be key uh, in any functional programming language, OK? Functional programming is about many different things, but some of those uh, could be these ones. It means concern separation, which means that you're able to compose the different operations that are going to be part of your architecture in a very declarative way. And we are kind of separating that from the actual moment when we are going to be running the whole execution tree. That's very related to functional programming. Also concepts like purity or referential transparency. Purity is, um, for example, I should be able to call uh, a method one 1,000 times, or a function. And if I pass the same uh, input values every single time, I should get the same result back 1,000 times, every single time, OK? That happens because the function is pure. There are no side effects. The function is not trying to do anything behind the scenes or access, for example, any external state, any shared state, or modify anything uh, out of its uh, very given scope. All right? It's not trying to store anything in a database, render anything on a screen. All those things are side effects. Um, referential transparency, that's a very simple concept. And it's just talking about that, about how a function can be completely transparent, about what is it returning and what is, what is it asking for. OK? We, we can know that just by looking at, it, at its types. OK? Just by looking at its return type or input types, we are able to know exactly what is it going to be returning and what is it asking for. Also, other key concepts like pushing a state aside and many more. Okay? If you look at the language uh, carefully, you are probably going to find a lot of uh, very function-oriented features, like high-order functions, functions as first-class citizens, um, extension functions, also um, sometimes even the language is kind of abstracting behaviors to functions, which is kind of very, very uh, functional style. And uh, for example, the collections API functions, very well known ones like uh, fold, map, uh, reduce, or whatever, all those are high order functions that are abstracting a behavior inside of a function and requesting, requesting sorry, some implementation details from the external world, uh, which need to be passed in by using another function as a parameter. Okay. But the language it's, uh, uh, still lacks some important features that, at least as I see the functional programming, are completely required to go uh, fully functional programming in a pure and type safe style, OK? Like higher kinds or type classes, but many more. So Kotlin by itself, uh, I don't think we can say it's exactly a functional language, but that's uh, a bit hard to, 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 to say. But, uh, the important thing is if it's still able to support functional programming. I mean, if we can enable that on top of the language. So if you think about all the languages, like Scala, for example, uh, the languages by themselves uh, using the uh, standard library, they are not providing a fully functional programming style in a type safe and pure way. There are new libraries built on top of that that are kind of enabling this style, right? So we try to do the same um, by working on a library called Category uh, that we have been working on. And uh, um, we started in the Spanish community, but then a lot of people joined from all over the world. Uh, we have a lot of people from the project here uh, right in front of me, like Paco, Pablo Guardiola, Simon, also Eugenio. I can see him right now. There he is. But many, 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 many people from all or uh, around the world are contributing to this uh, very interesting project, OK? Category is about bringing functional types and abstractions over the language, over Kotlin. It's inspired by libraries like the ones I was, I was mentioning before, like Scala set or uh, type, type level cats. 
And it's, of course, open to public contribution. OK? So we are going to try to use this library to solve some very key problems that we can find in a lot of systems nowadays. OK? I mainly do Android, but these problems are very generic, so this solution should be able to, get to be applied uh, over any possible system using Colony, of course. One very key problem uh, could be modeling error and success cases, because almost any system out there needs to reach an external source of data to retrieve some data from it and maybe model it inside of our domain model. But at the same time, those uh, external data sources or, or whatever we want to call them can throw exceptions, right? So we need to be able to also model those exceptions or those errors inside our domain, OK? Another big problem is asynchrony and threading, which is very, very well known in the JVM community or in all, on, on all the JVM languages, let's say. Side effects, we've been playing with this for a long time in object-oriented programming. We keep doing it all the time. And we are going to need to learn how to get rid of those in a graceful way, thanks to functional programming. Because side effects are kind of error-prone, and uh, you need to find a way to push them aside when you are doing functional programming. Dependency injection, of course, and testing, OK? So let's start. Uh, by the very beginning, trying to model those error and success states uh, inside of our system. If we think about one of the more mm, vanilla Java approaches that we can uh, think about, uh, which would be those uh, kind of use cases or commands or interactors that we can find in many different architectures, but particularly in, in, particularly in clean architecture. But you can also find those in other architectures like the iOS Viper one and any others, like ports and adapters. In the end, what you have is a command that you can re, uh, execute m many different times. And that command is going to be wrapping some business logic. And maybe it's also going to be used as a bridge to be able to query the, those external sources, like data sources or repositories or whatever, to avoid doing that directly from our presenter or our view model. right? So those use cases are quite simple. And we work quite years to manage. Uh, to manage them in this way. What I'm doing here is just inject a couple of dependencies, which would be a data source and a logger. And then when I try to run this inside of, inside of a different thread using prob probably provided by a thread pool executor, what I'm going to be doing is fetch the heroes from the data source. And then if everything goes all right, I will notify the result using the callback. But if anything goes wrong, I'm just uh, on this case, I'm going to log it, maybe to Fabric or whatever, and then I will notify that also using the callback. But this, to me, is a bit dirty approach because it has some uh, given problems, like these ones. For example, you are kind of forced to catch the exception inside of the thread. I mean, if we are running this inside of a thread, we are kind of uh, mandatorily forced uh, to catch the exception here because otherwise, uh, the exception would be lost. I mean, threads kind of swallow exceptions. Exceptions are not able to surpass thread boundaries. So I cannot just let this exception reach the previous level in the call chain, OK? Because uh, the presenter, for example, uh, who, which could be calling this code, but uh, running it on a different thread, uh, could be waiting forever, OK? So I kind of need to catch it and then change the way I propagate that exception using callbacks, which is not quite cool. And this is kind of also breaking referential transparency because we are not able to, just by looking at the return type, uh, know what's happening here. We need to look at the callback, and then the callback itself is not even saying anything about the error type, if you look at it. So it's not pretty cool. Maybe we can improve this in some way. One possible alternative could be to use a kind of a wrapper type to make both worlds living together, the error and the success. Uh, results, uh, maybe like this. Uh, this is just the constructor, but it would be a simple Java bean or whatever that could, be, uh, could have both worlds living together, depending on the case. It could probably have also some uh, utility methods to ensure that the error or the val uh, successful return types uh, or the successful values, sorry, um, are not living together, OK? Because it should be one or the other, but not both of them at the same time. And uh, yeah, we can maybe model our domain errors using an enum because we are still using Java here. And uh, the use case could look something like this, OK? 
I'm just requesting the heroes from the data source, and now what I'm returning is a result, which could be an error or maybe a list of, valid list of uh, superheroes, okay? Then I can just match over the, the type of the, of the result, and if it's an error, I can log it, and either way, I can just return the value. But obviously, I am tricking here, because I just got rid of, uh, you know, the asynchronicity and the threading here. I am just ignoring it. It's not possible to do this right now. I mean, we should have some system that could allow us to write asynchronous code as if it was synchronous, to be able to kind of just move the, 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 real, the actual result to the return type. But we are still not there. So let's try to use Arex Java, which could be one system that kind of allows the, to do this in a very good way, right? So let's say that we have a, you know, a network data source implementation that it's going to be fetching some heroes from the, the official Marvel API. And uh, what I'm returning here is going to be uh, an observable, which is uh, just a single. And the single, uh, it's going to be waiting for some observer to subscribe. And when it happens, uh, we are going to be fetching the heroes and then notifying them uh, the, the result if everything goes all right using the callback. Uh, but if it's not, we are using the on error termination events to notify it. I know that on error are termination events, and you probably want to do something uh, more you know, graceful, like uh, recovering from errors using different uh, operators or whatever. But this is not the point of this on this slide. I want you to look at how the, you know, the use case could look like. It's much more simple right now, right? Because we are kind of uh, wrapping both worlds together in a single stream. So we can just have a single or a unidirection and flow thanks to this, and we can return the, the observable uh, as the return value of the whole thing, of the whole use case. So this is a bit better. And also um, about uh, threading, we can just use the schedulers, which are pretty well integrated inside of, of the Arex Java API. So it's quite simple, and I think it's much better. But if we want to go functional, because I think this approach would be more like a functional reactive programming or something like that. But if we want to go pure functional programming, we would do something like this. We are going to be using a class that we have inside category. okay? And uh, it's an either. The either is very well known in any other functional programming libraries and languages. And it's just going to be explicit, a type, a type that is going to be explicit about uh, a disjunction. OK, an actual disjunction. So it's like saying it's going to be either an error or a success value, but, nev but never both of them at the same time. So we are modeling that duality using an, an actual type, an actual functional type. So we can uh, start using Kotlin now. We are going to model our domain errors using a sealed class. OK, the domain error is always going to be like a sealed hierarchy of, uh, of errors, because we, uh, it's always going to be a limited amount of errors that we are going to be supporting inside our the main layer. So the data source implementation could start looking a bit different now. What I'm going to be doing here is uh, uh, trying to fetch the heroes from the service. And when they are uh, uh, back, what I'm going to be doing is mapping all those DTO, network DTOs, because I don't want to be using the network DTOs across all my, my different layers on the architecture to try to not poison it with them. So I will map them to some domain models, and after that, I'm going to be returning. A, I'm going to be wrapping that result inside of a write. Okay, the write is one of the implementations of the either type. You can have two of them, left or right. Okay, it's just talking about the different side of, sides of it. Uh, by convention, the errors are usually presented on the left side of the of the either. Okay, so. Since this is the successful result, I will be returning it wrapped inside of a write. But if anything happens, what I'm going to be doing is uh, map the exceptions that are going to be thrown by the API or whatever to some of those domain models and the return, return them uh, wrapped inside of uh, left, because left is for the error type by convention. Okay. So what I'm getting back from it is a very explicit return type saying that it could be either an error or a valid list of heroes. And the use case can just fold over the either that I'm returning from the implementation of the data source and uh, apply different lambdas depending on the case. So the first lambda is the one that will be always applied over the error type 
but if it's a successful uh, result, the one on the right or the second one would be applied, okay? So we fall over the E there to apply different effects depending on the case. And if we have a standard model view presenter pattern, the presenter could look something like this. We do, again, the same thing. We are folding over the already composed either to apply different effects over the view depending on the case. If it's an error, it would be drawing the error. But if it's a successful result, it would be drawing the valid list of heroes. This would be the two methods I'm calling from the two lambda bodies. And uh, as, you can, as you can see there, uh, the error is just matching over the error type and providing different effects over the view depending on, the, on that type. And the valid drawing uh, list of heroes as is just uh, drawing them. I'm, I'm also mapping them to some renderable models, just in case, and then telling the view to render them. But we are still ignoring the threading and asynchronicity here. We need to do something about that, all right? So what could we do? Uh, up to date with that, we have uh, different alternatives. Just as a very brief recap about the vanilla Java approach, we were using the thread pool executor plus exceptions and callbacks. With the RX Java, it was all about the schedulers plus observable and error subscripti sus subscription. Sorry. And with category and trying to go functional, we would do something very different. If you think about uh, you know, when you request something from an API or maybe you go to try to fetch some, something from a database, what you are really doing is an I.O. computation. You are going to some external source to retrieve something from it. That's an I.O. computation by definition. So on functional programming, you use uh, something uh, that is usually used uh, to model those, those computations, which is called the, the I.O. monad, okay? You don't really need to get into what's a monad right now. We are not going to explain that. It's just the class that it's able to, to flat map its content. But anyways, that's not very important right now. What we are going to be doing is wrapping our computation inside of an I.O. to be able to be, make it become pure, which means that the computation itself is a side effect. It's going to be rendering something on a screen or querying something to an API. That's a side effect. What we do with I.O. is wrap it inside of a, some sort of a, a wrapper or, a, or a, a package or whatever, and that's going to be the thread in time. It's a still not going to be run, OK? So that's how we become a side effect computation into a pure function. And thanks to I.O., we are going to be able to make that I.O. computation explicit inside of the, all the types, inside of all the return types on the chain. So this is what we will have. We are just wrapping the either inside a file. What we are saying here literally is, I wraps a computation that could return either an error or a valid list of heroes when it gets unfolded or unwrapped, OK? But never both. So the network data source implementation using I.O. could look like this. I'm here using just a utility function that I created for running uh, that uh, lambda called f inside of a coroutine from the call Linux uh, package. That code is going to be run inside of the coroutine, and then I am pro providing two lambdas to, do, to react differently depending if, uh, if uh, everything goes all right or, or there is an error. So if there is an error, I'm just going to be logging it, and then I'm mapping the exception to one of those domain character errors just by using an extension function that I used, that I added here for syntax. But this is just a plain mapping. And then I'm going to wrap the result inside of a left, OK? Because this is an, it's an error. This is another extension function that I added here to be able to lift the value inside of a left, uh, OK? Um, for the success case, what I'm going to be doing is mapping the heroes to a collection of, of uh, domain models and then returning the result wrapped inside of a write, OK? Then I'm also providing some called AC, which is an async context, which is going to be used to, to be able to actually do an asynchronous computation and provide the result inside of an I.O., which is what I want, OK? But it's not very important. What I want you to look at is the return type now. As you can see, I have the I.O. computation uh, clearly reflected inside of the return type. 
And uh, everything is very explicit about the, uh, the types uh, this function could be returning. So the caller easily knows that uh, what it's going to be returning here is an IO computation that could be returning when it gets some fault, either an, a character error or a list of heroes. So the use case is a bit uh, weird right now because uh, since we have two monads kind of uh, nested inside of the stack, we need to map twice. First, we get the I.O. that the data source is returning, and we map over it to be able to get access to the either and then map over it. Just to apply some, uh, maybe this, uh, apply some business logic, which would be, for example, discarding some of those error, uh, heroes on the list. Okay? So we will find a workaround for it to be able to not need to map twice. But let's wait a bit. It's not going to be yet. So the presentation logic is going to be doing something interesting here. Because I'm taking a decision, and it's about performing the side effects. Okay? I want to break purity right now. I'm on the presenter, and I want to, do, to tell the IO that the use case is returning to actually unfold itself and run its deferred computation, which is stored inside. Okay? Until now, everything was pure. The computation was still not run. But I am actually now uh, explicitly telling it to execute that computation. That's the unsafe run async that I have after the use case call. So when that gets unfolded, I will get access to the, to the, to the I.O., and then I can map it to, the, you know, to, to be able to fold over the either. Okay? But this is not ideal, because I don't really want to apply side effects on my presentation layer. Okay? My objective, or my main goal here, would be to try to get rid of side effects ac across the whole execution chain, except for the edges of the, of the system, which would be, in my case, the view implementation, if I'm talking about Android, or iOS, or any front-end system. OK, so what could we do? to kind of uh, achieve this goal. OK, the first, uh, I mean, the, the most obvious way would be to try to not return the already computed value from the presenter, but try to return a deferred computation, OK? Since Kotlin is an eagerly evaluated language, I try, uh, what I need to do is kind of mimic that uh, lazy evaluation by returning a function instead of the already computed value, all right? So the idea would be to return functions on all the levels of my architecture instead of already computed values. If I do that, on each one of the levels, what I'm doing is swapping proactive evaluation with the third computation, OK, or the third execution. So I can do something like this. I can just uh, return a function from the presenter that it's going to be waiting for some dependencies to be passed into its work. And I can do the same on the use case. And I can, again, do the same on the data source. So if I keep returning functions on all those levels, and I call the presenter from the view implementation, what I'm going to get back is a composed computation that it's still not run. And the view implementation is it's going to have the power or the choice to, to, to actually run it, finally. Okay. As you can see, the data source can just extract uh, the API client, which would be one of the dependencies, dependencies from inside of the dependencies provided, and actually do something with it, like fetching the heroes. But passing dependencies manually all the way down could be a bit painful, so we need to find a workaround or a way to kind of do that implicitly or inject those dependencies. Okay. OK. So we are going to be using something called the reader monad. OK? Uh, this is, again, a monad, so we can flat map over, it, over its content and so on. And it's a ki kind of composable uh, with other monads of the same type. And uh, what you get with the reader is mainly uh, wrapping a computation with this type, which means uh, from D to A. D here would uh, stand for the dependencies of the computation. It's one of the levels that we were uh, showcasing before, uh, where we were re all returning a function for each one of those which was waiting for some dependencies to get passed in. That's exactly the type that we have here. Each one of those would correspond or 
to one of those computations we can store inside of our reader. And then we can compose all of them together using different readers. This uh, stands just for the reader context. That's the name you use uh, to give it. And uh, it's just the dependencies that the computation needs to actually run. So the reader is implicitly, it's going to be able to implicitly pass those dependencies out, uh, you know, automatically all the way down, so we can avoid uh, to do that uh, manually by ourselves. Uh, just a little advice, uh, as I see the context uh, of the reader, I would uh, just think about it, it as all the dependencies that the composed computation that we have across the different layers need to be able to do its work, OK? So it's actually solving both, uh, both cons concerns that we have until now, which were, was to defer computations at all levels, and also to inject dependencies by automatically uh, passing them uh, uh, across the different steps of the architecture. So I'm wrapping the whole type inside of a reader now. This is one more monad to add on top of the stack, and then of course, this is starting to look a bit bad. Uh, so don't worry too much, because we will find a workaround for this, OK? But we are still being explicit about what we return. This is now a reader, which is going to be just deferring a computation and actually automatically passing all the dependencies down. And the compu computation is still the same than before, which would be a computation that could return either an error or a list of heroes. Um, so the data source implementation is a bit different now. We can just keep doing the same we were doing until now, but now we are adding something on top of it. If you look at the beginning of the method, what I'm doing there is called the reader.ask method. The reader.ask function is uh, defined over the reader companion object, so I can call it uh, statically, let's say, and I can automatically, automatically lift a reader from nothing, lift a reader from the context. So this reader is uh, actually wrapping that computation from context to context. This is just like a trick to lift a reader from nothing, because I don't have uh, any reader yet, and then I can map over it. Sorry. There it is. I can map over it to get access to the context, which, is, uh, which are the dependencies, and then use them instead of the computation that I was creating. The rest of, uh, of uh, the method is exactly the same we had before. But now we can access the context by mapping over the reader and then use it to be able to extract the dependencies from it. Okay? Here, it would be the API client and the threading, for example, the threading implementation we are, we are using. So as we were saying, depend explicit dependencies are not needed anymore, and uh, that's what we get when we call the reader.ask method. So the use case now, as you can see, we have three monads on the stack. So the use case now needs to map three times over uh, the result that we are getting from the data source in order to get access to the list of heroes and be able to discard any, any heroes from the, from the list. And the presenter is just doing the same. It's asking for a reader first, and when we get access to the reader, we can flat map already to get access to the content, the, to the context. The context or the dependencies from the reader are uh, on the second line there. And what I'm applying is uh, the data class deconstruction or, uh, over the context, because it's a data class. So I can get uh, rapid access to one of its properties, which would be the the view contract, OK? And then I just keep doing the same thing I was do doing until now, OK? I map, uh, I can map and then fold uh, to provide different uh, effects, depending on the case. So what we have now is, uh, I think I lost the, the audio. Sorry. OK, OK, it's working now. OK, sorry. So what I have now is the complete computation uh, composed and deferred in time. So when the view implementation is going to ask uh, or query the presenter to get the heroes back, what it's going to get in return, it's going to be a, uh, here it is. It's going to be a reader, OK? So we can actually, inside of the view implementation, 
take the, the decision of actually run the whole computation, providing a context. This is the moment where we are going to actually stop uh, purity or make purity become unsafe effects. OK? We are literally telling it to unfold and this position providing a given context. That context is going to just be a data class containing all the dependencies that the whole computation chain needs to unfold at all its levels. So on testing and scenarios, um, what I just really need to do is run the exact same code, but provide a different implementation of the context, which could contain some mocks or a face or a spice or whatever I want for the given dependencies I want to, to, to fake. So yeah, I think uh, we don't need to change that, uh, that production code, because we can just provide a different uh, context. So testing becomes quite easy when it's, uh, we're talking about end-to-end -end test or any sort of test where we, where we really need to replicate the whole execution tree. But uh, we need to find a way or a workaround to solve that kind of nested types hell that we were provoking for the, this kind of too big monad stack that we were composing here. And uh, that happens because monads by themselves do not comp compose gracefully. And I mean with this that uh, if you have monads uh, of the same type, you can just flap map over them and they compose pretty easily and properly. But if you have different monads on the stack, like the case we have today here, you end up having a pretty deep uh, nested uh, levels of, uh, of uh, different types inside of the return type. So what we are going to be using, and this is what any functional programming would do as the next iteration, would be to start using monad transformers, OK? A monad, uh, a monad transformer is just a way to gift an already existing monad with new behaviors, OK? So what we are going to be doing here to achieve uh, that is try to get this type, this kind of uh, uh, already transforming monad, which would be uh, trying to, we would be applying the either capabilities over the IO, and then we would be adding the reader capabilities on top of the already transforming monad. So what we have in, res in return is like a single type, which is going to be able to do all the things that the other three types were doing by, uh, you know, separately. You can then use a type alias to simplify uh, the, the usage. And then you have something like this. What we have here is uh, just a class that is going to be able to take care about all the concerns that any app could have, like error handling, asynchrony, IO operations, and dependency injection all together. So this is a solution that you could reuse on any system out there. Because the problems we are solving are completely generic and not bounded to any context uh, or semantics from this very given application. So we are going to be changing again the, the data source implementation. And we are going to be using something, uh, some syntactic sugar that we have coded inside of category, which is the monad comprehensions. And monad comprehensions are very related to what we call do notation or for comprehensions in other languages, like Haskell or Scala, but inside of the context of a monad, which means that uh, this is enabling uh, something that we have already talked about, and it's, uh, it's uh, sequentially execute different asynchronous or maybe also synchronous uh, um, statements one after another by flat mapping the results of uh, the first one to the second one, and then the result from the second one to the third one, and so on. So we are kind of mimicking the, the imperative style or the synchronous style, even if what we have here could be a bunch of asynchronous uh, operations. Okay, And it's not just a for comprehension, because, uh, but a mona comprehension, because it's also lifting the result inside of the context of the monad itself. So the result would be uh, wrapped inside of an async result. OK? So this would be more or less the execution order. OK? In the end, I get the already flat mapped and lifted the result inside of the context of the monad, which would be the async result here. Thanks to this, and since we already have all the types collapsed into a single one, the use case does not need to map three times anymore. Just once is more than enough to get access to its uh, contained or wrapped value, which would be the very list of heroes. 
And the presenter could easily look like this, which is quite readable, right? And we still have the same power since, since the new uh, transformed type is still a reader because it's, it still has the capabilities of a reader. We can still uh, decide on the view implementation when we want to run or perform all the unsafe effects, providing the context to it. So again, for testing, we can just keep passing a different implementation of the context to mock some of the dependencies. All right? Just two more extra bullets. If uh, you're interested in working on cate uh, with category and also on functional programming, you can also uh, implement two very advanced styles using this library, which would be uh, tagless final and free moment. Okay? I'm not going to be talking in very deep about both because there is no time for that, but just a very brief explanation of each one of those so you can get a step inside of the repo and take a look at how they really look because you have good code examples of each one of those on the sample repo. So tagless final would be just composing the whole computation tree on your architecture depending on abstractions. But this time, the abstractions would be defined by type classes. Okay? The type class is just uh, some abstraction that can be applied just over a bunch of different types. Okay? So if we define our whole, computa whole computation depending on uh, or in terms of those abstractions, then we are opening the possibility to pass the concretions later on to resolve the ambiguity. So when we are real ready to run the whole computation tree, we could be able to pass the implementation details providing the concrete instances for those type classes. So tagless final, final would be more or less like that in very broad terms. You have good examples of this in the sample repo, OK? Free monads, uh, in the end, it's very similar if we just go straight to the, its benefits. But it's a bit different on uh, the way we are going to be implementing it. What you do is just define an algebra of operations that you can define uh, using an algebraic data, types which, data type, which could be a simple seed class. So you can define the different operations that your system or your architecture is going to have inside of that seed class. And then what you do is lift each one of those operations to the context of free. So what you are going to be doing is playing with all those already lifted, uh, separated uh, operations and compose your whole execution tree using those. So what you get there is a completely abstract syntax tree of operations that is still not bounded to any semantics. So when the interpreter comes in later on, what it can do is provide the implementation details, provide the semantics. So again, we are kind of having that concern separation. We declare our whole abstract tree, and then the moment to run it comes later on. And that's pretty cool for testing, because that's kind of removing the need for dependency injection, right? So you also have good examples of this in the repo. There is a pull request very well, de uh, very, uh, well detailed uh, explaining all the different steps to achieve this style. And just to wrap things up with a very final slide, as we were saying before, all the patterns and solutions that we have been applying today can be applied to any application out there. I mean, if we we're talking about Android, you could probably wrap that inside of a library and reuse it uh, forever, because it's resolving those problems that you always have, like uh, decoupling the uh, dependency injection, asynchrony, IO computations, error handling, and so on. And that also means that if you have other systems or platforms, like backend or uh, front end or whatever that are also using Kotlin, uh, they are most likely going to have many of these problems also. So they could also share these types to solve their problem. Because we are not binding it to any semantics from my given app application from client code. Okay? They will also need to, the, to inject dependencies, for example. Uh, functional programming is mo mostly about that. You try to solve something once and try to reduce that solution once forever. Because what you solve are very, very key and generic problems in a very abstracted uh, way. So you have an Android application coded four times inside of the sample repo. 
And each one of those is going to have one different functional programming style. Okay, so the most basic one would be the one, the one about monad stack, which is the first one that we have been explaining across the whole talk. Then you can iterate it, uh, taking a look at the monad transformers example. Then you can also check the tagless final and free monads uh, styles. And of course, uh, the, also the medium block where I'm writing a lot about this uh, lately. Okay, and I'll keep uh, publishing new new blog posts in the following. Uh, days and weeks, because uh, most of them are, are already written. So uh, that will be all. Thank you. <laughs>